You are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me today, I didn't give you a name. You did not. Spencer, the Stockholm Street Surgeon Church. It's a, Stockholm has like good health care. I don't think you need to be doing street no. surgery. Today, special guest, and it's actually a guest that is working. The technology That's has, supposed to be here. Yeah, that's supposed to be here. That was scheduled and everything. Today's guest is a screenwriter, author, poet, publisher, lyrical journalist, and cat lover. Do not want to forget yeah. that. The most are, important part, actually. Yeah, they, it, it, well, you see the yeah. scratches I have, so yeah, cat loving is a, it's a double-edged sword. They are also a grant winner, Elgin Award nominee, recipient of a Silver Honorable Mention in the L. Ron Hubbard Writers of the Future Award, and winner of the 2022 Defunct May Day Chatbook Contest, and here to talk about their latest short story collection, Losers and Freaks. I welcome C.E. Hoffman. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. My bio is a mouthful. I've got to change that shit. <laughs> I, I think that was the most professional I've ever done yeah. an introduction on here because I usually blunder them. I always get the name wrong somehow. <laughs> it could be like John Smith and I'll be like, John Smythe. Oh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so you're already uh, you know you at least got the introduction down didn't ask you any previous questions before we started no. or what you wanted to talk about but your book is it out yet uh losers and freaks yeah i mean if we're not time traveling too much on the release it's available for pre-order for all of june and then for the canadian listeners however many of those there are there's going to be an in-person book party in edmonton alberta june 30th and then that's when the book is officially available but you can pre-order it now which is pretty sweet after this podcast you're going to be hot in canada because we have 12 listeners from saskatchewan double digits that is double digits not every episode but they do Mm. listen I get the stats. They can drive right over Edmonton, mm. Alberta. They can just pop in for it. Yes, please. Saskatchewaners, <laughs> come to the book party, please. Yeah, wh- where is the book party for the people who want to come? Do you actually, is it a private book party or is it, because sometimes we get people on here and their book party is a big, you know, party at an actual museum or something. They want everyone to come. I mean, I hope it's not going to be too museum-like with how many people actually show up. It's mostly going to be probably friends and family, but people are welcome as long as they're nice and got good vibes. It's going to be at the (laughs) Grindstone Theater. Yeah, that's an important amendment, right? Like a qualifier. You have to be nice, please. Like, don't come (laughs) and crash the book party. And then just eat all the hors d'oeuvres and be a dickhead. Yeah, you don't want that. (laughs) Exactly. Canada's known for their assholes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I know, man. We are the the worst pushover dicks ever. (laughs) So how did uh, Losers and Freaks come to fruition here? Was this just like you wrote short stories over a certain time period and then just put it together? Or was this something that uh, you specifically went into? It was like, oh, this is going to be a collection I'm doing with an overarching theme and stuff. Yeah, I'm very theme oriented in my literary practice for sure. And I think I was kind of piggybacking on Sluts and Horrors, my first short story collection, which came out from Thurston Howe Publications back in 2021. So there was an obvious like coherence there, you know, a cogency with that theme. But there's another running theme for me, of course, that I notice in my writings, like you do have see a lot of sexuality, a lot about trauma, a lot about sex work. But then on this other side, they kind of intertwine too. But you see like a lot of fuck ups, a lot of misfits, a lot of people who are stuck on the outside looking in. And I realized that they really deserved their own collection in that sense. So that's just how I migrated into this new idea of losers and freaks. Honestly, I was hoping Sluts and Horrors was going to be successful enough that I could launch into a novel release for my next full length release, but that didn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) And and you care to elaborate or is that just one of those things? Eh, didn't happen. (laughs) Well, I wrote... I guess it was my sixth or my seventh novel uh, when I was stuck in a super, super expensive college town in southern Ontario for a very, very brief time. And I slammed out a novel in that time. And I was had really, really high hopes for it because it does all my weird dream of consciousness, slice of life shit. But it hasn't been picked up so far and it lost out on an award I was really, really hoping for. So I was kind of like, okay, it's like time to step back. That said, I had already been pitching Losers and Freaks. Like I'd already kind of gotten the idea that I needed to (laughs) go another way. But honestly, Corencia Press has been amazing. Like I can't say enough nice things about Emily, the editor-in-chief, you know, 
just main person there. She's just incredible. She does everything. She designed the book cover. You know, she's been with me every step of the way. And she is like so patient. I was the worst. I, literally, when we were like ready to like send it to typesetting kind of shit, I would email her and be like, can I add this extra poem? Can I add this little story that I just wrote on the bus? Because it's so perfect. Oh, my God. And she, every time she was just like, sure, where do you want it to go? Like, angel, she's an angel. I wish she could be at the book party, you know, so we could celebrate this, like, culmination of all this work that we've done together. It's definitely a project where I have felt really close to my editor during it. And that's a nice feeling, because I think sometimes there's so much antagonism between the writers and the editors, even though we're usually one and the same. Like, it's nice to just feel like we're so in on this together, you know? So I do have super high hopes for losers and freaks and actually this is kind of a fun pre-announcement so this is exciting i was going to announce it at the book party but thurston Howe publications is sadly going under and emily and Corencia press have agreed to give a second life to sluts and whores so there's going to be a re-release of sluts and whores coming up hopefully in a few years too so i mean and i think that just attests to how i feel about this publisher they've been phenomenal like from back to front did we just get a dpw exclusive might have that might be our first yeah hell's yeah that is exciting because i'm terrible at my job i only started reading your collection some yesterday and some today so obviously i didn't finish (laughs) it but what i was surprised about was kind of the experimental style of some of the work and when you're talking about like a relationship with the editor that could actually be very difficult depending on the editor when you write in that kind of style uh sometimes loose sometimes you know bizarre just whatever you're doing like uh, et- like editors just love to get in sometimes to justify their job depending on the press uh sometimes they just want to be helpful but they don't see what you're seeing because you know if you're just writing in a normal style this is you know the grammar or whatever the fixes they want to make or some plot point or something but when it's more experimental it could definitely be detrimental like some of the advice they might give you have you come across that i mean you said you like the editor yeah she's been i think that's why i've been so lucky she's been very understanding of my voice and i'm sure you probably noticed already just dipping into the collection that i There's almost like two distinct styles that I work in. I definitely work in that experimental stream of consciousness, you know, like wannabe Virginia Woolf on acid kind of shit, you know, or I guess Irvin Welsh, like a femme Irvin Welsh is probably more accurate (laughs) with that. But then I also just have this like very brusque, he said, she said, they went, they died, blah, 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 you know, just like very terse, tacit kind of prose, you know, and I think that's for me personally, like very inspired by Martin Miller, who's been like an amazing uh, guide to me in my writing for like, wow, um, like decades now, which is kind of amazing. So big shout out to Martin, bless his heart. And like, I want to find a way to combine the two. You know, I think that that would be when I really find my voice is if I could have this like kind of stark, you know, just really accessible, almost minimalist prose, but then just have it shot up with this like weird ass shit as well. You know, I think that would be like, I knew I would have made it in my voice and where I'm wanting to go if I could combine those two. And I think Emily was really yeah, just really understanding of where I'm going with my voice, you know, where I'm going and where I want to go. And she was just very good. I mean, again, like you were saying, like, I love how you said it, like, but so many editors to justify their existence will just mangle with shit, right? And she doesn't do that. The best teachers, the best editors, the best leaders, I think, just kind of leave you alone. And she's been phenomenal with that. Yeah, if you can get somebody that can actually actually appreciate the art, and even if they don't understand what you're doing, they can acknowledge that what you're doing is important to you and whatever readership you might be garnering from your work, it's going to be very specific and tailored to that kind of style. So they can't change it too much. Make helpful suggestions, yes, but actually try to change, say, you know, one of the stories, like, oh, this gets just too weird. Well... That you know, how do you tell somebody to change the story like that? Just get rid of it. I mean, if it's important to the, <laughs> that's one of those things. Like with short story collections, if it's important to the author, uh, it's it's really hard. I mean, sometimes you do have to make those mm-hmm. cuts, but I, I haven't worked with too many editors. Uh, just like short stories for anthologies and stuff, but. Fortunately, I haven't had that, hey, you might have to get rid of this whole scene or this whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, but I love it so much, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, it's funny because, of course, the Beats, they taught us first thought, best thought, but then they also really embrace the adage of kill your darlings. And they are kind of seemingly oppositional. But I think that they're they're important to give both their due just at different different parts of the process, right? Like when you're just winging it and you're just putting it down, you know, just just do what you do and let the muse guide you where you want, right? But yeah, editing, that is probably the time to cut it out. But at the same time, like you're so right that it's so different looking at a short story or a short story collection. I think that idea of like, you've got to nix this scene, you've got to nix this chapter, you've got to nix this character. I think those kinds of deep, deep cuts really belong in novel editing more so than you know a a short story or a whole collection because this is more just kind of like another gallery of my work chapbooks are the same thing right they're just kind of a weird little funky gallery where people can poke their head in and be like hey what the fuck is up with this person and just kind of get a glimpse and I hope that my short story collections have succeeded in that giving people a glimpse of where I'm going and you know what I want to do with art I think if I'm being honest though the release that has been most efficient at that so far was uh, No Actual Sin which was that chapbook that I mentioned in my super wordy bio <laughs> that won the the defunct contest like and it's all experimental like really mm-hmm. really weird like very deep into the mental health stuff deep into the sexuality stuff and it's one of those ones for me which is such a nice gift for a writer where I can read it front to cover and go yes like that did what it's supposed to do I can put that down I can rest you know and I don't know if I'm there quite yet with with the short story collections it's so hard to just let things go when they're that lengthy you know but we'll see when I'm holding losers and freaks in my hands and I do that first read through then I'll get back to you guys on the lunch yeah that's that's the thing sometimes you got to give it time and then when you go back to it when it's almost not your work anymore because you have enough (laughs) distance from it you're reading it with fresh eyes and sometimes you're like what the fuck was I thinking other times you're like holy shit if that wasn't my work i would have thought that was brilliant you know like you could actually appreciate it a little more and now this might be a little off base so i hope you don't find offense to this but one of my first um opinions when i was reading this it almost reminded me of like a young henry rollins if he wrote urban fantasy <laughs> like this punk rock like straightforward a kind of visceral but more literary i think like there's definitely more like a lyrical quality to it than henry rollins but just some of it, like his early novels i i've read it's just got that, that like that blunt quality to it and that's, that's, that wasn't every story i read just some of them but i was just like i like this it's mm-hmm. different and kind of fun like the imagination just from the stories i've read like the ones i've read in this collection uh i was not expecting that when you reached out like i didn't expect like the urban fantasy elements so having not read your back work is that uh what your like basis was when you started writing i mean first of all thanks so much you know for for giving a nod to the punk influence because it is rampant in my work and it's so so nice to have that scene that gets me so excited when people (laughs) mention it like oh yeah some punk subculture stuff and i'm like yay finally thank you yeah i haven't read any of his novels but now i'm stoked to do so so thanks for lengthening my tbr i always appreciate that and uh yeah like the punk voice is definitely there the genre stuff is such a struggle for me. Like when I was first pitching Sluts and Horrors and first promoing Sluts and Horrors, I really pushed down the fact like, yeah, this is urban fantasy. I was really, really pushing that out there. I was kind of forcing genrefication on myself. But then I realized that that left less room for the experimental narrative stuff that we've already alluded to. And I realized like, oh, this is kind of iffy. This doesn't really fit. And then again, like I reasoned looking at Irvin Welsh, you know, who is obviously a foremost inspiration as well. And even looking at someone like Michelle T, you know, looking at things like that, it's like they do have urban fantasy elements. They have magic realism elements, but people wouldn't necessarily come right out and call Irvin Welsh like an urban mm. fantasy or even a speculative fiction writer. Right? Even though there's like stories that he writes where God turns a guy into a fucking fly, like that's <laughs> obviously speculative. But when you think Irvin Welsh, you don't think that automatically. Right. So I've kind of stepped away from self-identifying as a genre author I think is the best way to put it just to like give myself more space I think to grow as an author but you're spot on right that it's it's definitely it has that weird shit it has the mental health content has the sexuality content it has the major punk emo alt influence but at, at its core they are still a lot of them it's either urban or it's fantasy or it's urban fantasy right it's almost always one or of the three right and yeah i still don't know like i still appreciate this feedback you know even just from you 
kind of dipping your toe into the collection, it's always so nice when you get this earnest, you know, judgment. And I say that in a positive way from readers, because you start to figure out like, okay, like that's where you would put me and that's what I'm going for. So even if I don't have a name for it, I guess it's still making sense to us somehow, Mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, I don't know. It's weird, but it works, I hope. (laughs) Well, one good thing about stepping away and doing more experimental work earlier in your career versus uh, like when you get more established is that you don't get pigeonholed. So you're not going to get pigeonholed Mm -hmm. as just an urban fantasy writer if you're you know, having collections like this come out that people like. That's that's rough because I'm already fighting that a little bit now because for whatever reason, I'm not even a horror writer, but I keep getting horror shit published. And then it's like, oh, I don't want to be known as the horror guy. I don't really write that, like my novel I'm working on, it's nothing like that. So if I get people that, you know, get a following for just my horror work, then it's like, oh, shit. Now I'm going to have to write a bunch of horror stuff to placate <laughs> these people. It's like, I don't want to do that, you know? Yeah, exactly the same. Even way, way back, you know, in my burgeoning career, I was mostly getting genre fiction published. Like, this is so embarrassing to admit. But seriously, if you like look way, way back in my CV, like 2010 through 2012, it's all horror and erotica, <laughs> like super cringe, right? <laughs> but it is. I, I can't lie, right? And I'm so glad that I didn't. Like you said, like I'm so glad I wasn't pigeonholed into that, and I've been able to go in different directions. And like. I think we all need to do that, though. I think the industry needs to be more forgiving. You know, this is a journey and this is growth for all of us. This is self-expression, which is a form of growth, right? And we we shouldn't have to brand ourselves, you know, the way we do. I think it's just so, like, stultifying and stagnating when we're like, oh, yeah, I just have to be this now, you know? And I think that we need to just let people be, you know, and let the writing be and become whatever it wants. You know, that's the whole point, right? Well, if I had any advice for aspiring writers, unless you specifically want to be known as a genre writer or, you know, even more specific, just a horror writer, just a sci fi writer, I would suggest making sure when you're submitting to publications, you have varied stories. So, you know, maybe you dabble in literary fiction, maybe you dabble in high fantasy, you know, keep your interests varied and keep your writing style varied and then that way you cast a wider net for your audience and then it won't be such a shock when you know the guy who has all these horror stories writes you know a romance or something like people won't be too turned off by that because that is one thing you can alienate your audience if you have a very specific audience you see that all the time in music you get the he sold out or they sold out (laughs) and it's just like well maybe they just want to try something different you know exactly i mean like think of new wave after punk right it's like they were just like we're done we want to do something else we want to do something new right and i'm totally with you and you can like you can alienate the readers in reverse if you're saying like except for example for me if i was just like oh yeah i write urban fantasy and then someone who just likes very you know prototypical urban fantasy opens up one of my books and goes what the fuck is this and drops it and it's like fuck you you know because you've betrayed their trust about what to expect so yeah, it's a, it's a fun ongoing, it is kind of a struggle, but it's also kind of a fun game of like, what actually am I? I think for me, it's like, how can I condense my writing identity into just a nice little neat phrase, you know, just kind of like my bio too. It's like, instead of all of this, like gobbledygook, you know, like how can I, you know, reduce this to something where it's just like, I'm like this. And the closest I've ever heard, even just in a review, uh, this amazing uh, guy who writes for Razor Cake fanzine, Justin Bookworm, he does reviews a lot there and other awesome content. And he described my stuff as something like uh, Irvin Welsh at his strangest or like Burroughs at his most lucid. Hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> like that's kind of, that's it. The joke I used to make to people is I wanted to somehow be a combination of C.S. Lewis and Irvin Welsh, but that was too much of a mind fuck for most people right. to contend <laughs> with. <laughs> well, like your story, uh, Stockholm Syndrome, A Love Story, I, th- I think that's the title. It's pretty much like Beauty and the Beast, but the realistic perspective of uh, Belle being, you know, Stockholm Syndrome. Is like, is she actually there because she wants to be there? Or is she fucking stuck with this monster? <laughs> it's just like, I, I mean, out of the stories I read so far, I think that might have been my favorite just because it was fun in a very morbid way. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, like, it shouldn't have been funny, but it kind of was. But then you also <laughs> got, like, the realism of, like, oh, if you were actually in this situation, It'd be really fucked up. Like, what do you do? You know? 
Oh, thanks. I'm so stoked that you like that one. I was worried that the writing maybe wasn't strong enough, but the story was important to me. Like I always used to joke. I used to call Beauty and the Beast, you know, when I was a cynical, know-it-all teenager, I called it Stockholm Syndrome, a love story. And that was what kind of gave me the idea. It was like my favorite Disney movie, apart from The Lion King. And then I think like, how much did this inculcate into me, like a romanticization of totally toxic mm -hmm. unions, right? Because it's like, they really change each other. And he and she like sets boundaries with him. Sure. But he's like, has horrible anger issues. And like, in the real world, he would totally have substance abuse issues. And like, oh, yeah, like, when does it right? And this idea of like, <clears throat> she runs away, and then she comes back. It's like such an obvious like attachment cycle, right? With a, an anxious and an avoidant. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thatcher and all this shit and like just this idea of like but is he actually going to change you know how many beasts actually mm. become the prince in time and even if you think the spell is broken like is it though and just get, like you said like kind of tampering with that fairy tale fantasy in a way that yeah I hope is still like playful you know and sardonic I'm glad that it still came off kind of fun like that definitely wasn't my voice that I was writing. And there were definitely some of my experiences that colored it, but I wanted to take it into that place. I liked the idea too, of kind of making her kind of steeped in these self-destructive tendencies with alcohol, you know, as a right. way to kind of numb her situation. And that's definitely not something I can relate to. So yeah, I'm glad that it, that it came off. I'm stoked about that. Thank you for that. Well, one of my favorite lines from that story, I actually marked it down because I enjoyed it. I've read it, reread it a couple of times. I really liked it. And it almost, it doesn't completely sum up the story, but it does give you a good feel for it. Sometimes his smile is my lifeline. My body bends before him, a leaf in a dust storm. It's easy to give in at first. Then the consequences pile up, and before you know it, you're Atlas with no way to shrug off the world. It's like I just I really like that imagery. Just like, yeah, the weight just piles on you to the point where it's like, well, now you're stuck. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. It's you know how you said like that idea of like being separated enough from your art, you know, that you can hear it as something new. And I'd totally forgotten about those lines. And yeah, I think that's you're so right. Not only does that just sum up like the story, you know, or toxic relationships, but I think it also just sums up how we can just find ourselves stuck in anything in life. Right. It's the boiled yeah. frog syndrome thing where suddenly you're just like, oh, shit. <laughs> Well, it's so easy just to, you know, we experience this. You're a working stiff, working a nine to five job. And on, before you know it, 15 years have gone by and you're doing the same thing. You're like, what the fuck happened to my life? Like, how did I get into this position and why did I stay here so long? Was it was it just the comfort of security? You know, was it uh, out of necessity? It usually starts as necessity. Yeah. You know, you, you have to make a living. You have to pay your rent or your mortgage yeah. or whatever. But at some point, it's like, I don't actually have to be living this way anymore, but I still am. And then that's yes. when you have the contemplation, self-loathing, all that stuff. All the fun stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not going to. I'm not going to guess how old you guys are. Like you, you look young and everything, but yeah, for me, things have definitely shifted for me since I turned 30, which is like almost two years ago now, you know, where it's like things were easier to just cast away and not worry about in my twenties. It's not like I was one of those people that had a bunch of fun in their twenties, far from it. I will <laughs> speak to you actually, but at the same time, like it was just a little, things hadn't piled up in the same way, you know? And I think when you hit 30, it is that Atlas moment where you're kind of like, oh, there's a there's a culmination here. Things that I worked on positively, my emotional health, my physical health, stuff like that. I can I'm reaping the rewards of that now. And for that, I'm grateful. But then there's other aspects of my life, you know, the financial stuff, the career stability stuff, where I'm looking at it and I'm exactly it's that moment of, oh shit, what did I do? Where did that time go? You know, like I'm I'm almost 32 and I had like an embarrassing deficit in my bank account, you know, and then there's people that you hear about that are not, let's just say, in that same financial situation, you know, and that comparison can be can be really, really harrowing. But in a way that's kind of the point of the collection for me. Like obviously there's that major mental health lean, but again, I want it to be more encompassing than that. I just want it to touch to that wounded part of all of us that are that's going, what happened? Where did the time go? Why me or why not me? Like we reject that victim aspect of ourselves so much. We mock it in others and in ourselves. We push it away. We disparage it. And I want this book to be like a safe place for people to just be like, fuck yeah, I just still feel like a fucking loser. And that's just be okay, you know, and for us to just like I was such a honestly, every single phase of my development, I found some reason to feel like an outcast, you know, and maybe I was legit sometimes and maybe sometimes not, just projecting it, but 
either way, it's something I haven't been able to shake. And I don't, I don't want to try to shake it anymore. I want to be okay with just feeling off and feeling weird and having these bad days and embracing these uncertainties of did I make the right choices? Am I going in the right place? Because like you say, I think at the end of the day, we're all feeling that to some degree. So I, I'm kind of hoping almost anyone could get some kind of comfort from this book. Like you're not alone. Like this is just life. Well, I think a very important thing to do, especially as you do get older, is just the self-reflection and really focusing on what you've actually accomplished. I mean, for you, like compared to us, I feel you're very accomplished in your writing. And I'm, you know, slightly envious that you have so many books and works out and publication. And up till what this last year, yeah. we've always been a little mad that we weren't able to put forth. And it wasn't even because we weren't able. It was just for whatever reason, we haven't put out the work that we wanted to. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do that and they focus on what they haven't accomplished and they really should focus more on what they've accomplished. And I'm not just talking about finances or, you know, even if it's just like chasing your dream, what you've managed to do with that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's as simple as you were able to live another day. You know, you're able to just like you, you look at rent for this month. Like yeah. that's a, you know, like, <laughs> right? that's a good one. Like you were able to whatever problems you might have had the previous year, you're able to overcome them. Some people have addiction problems. Some people have. Uh, they're in a bad relationship you know there's always things that you can look at the problem is people are too busy looking at everyone else and they don't really understand that hey i'm not that person i shouldn't be comparing myself to their life and their circumstances mm -hmm. because that's not my circumstances mm -hmm. i went through something different and unique and i should be able to appreciate how i overcame those things or focus on how i can overcome those things also, moving on, a minor digression. Oh, I got a weird buzz. Not the kind that you look you you'd like to have. No. <laughs> I had a diddle, did, uh, I had to diddle the knob over there. <laughs> did you do a nice hard cut? Because I like doing those sometimes. Just a jarring cut from what we're talking about. Uh, do it. <laughs> you had one of the greatest opening lines I've read in a story, so I wanted to read that on here as well. From the story, I ain't no and. Part of my pronunciation, I'm not a Latin speaker. I ain't no Albe Galanae Filius. So this opens with, Once upon a patriarchy in the big city, 28 years before its revolution and sequential decay, two strippers stole a baby. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. Once you read that, you have to read this fucking story. Well, I mean, what's that thing we've always said? Like, you know, you have to have that opening line to really yeah. hook the reader. I mean... If if two strippers still and a baby doesn't do it, I mean I don't go to the next story, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and then also if you don't want to read about strippers stealing a baby, then I guess you move on. Because you, know, you know what you're getting into. Oh yeah, man. I don't it's that's so nice. I'm so stoked that you liked that opening line. Cause you know, for me, I'm just like I'm always still trying to cram all of my world building shit, you know, in a way that's concise and in a way where people are like, I'm just like giving it to people in like little bites. So it's not all so weird to deal with. And that's what I see so much of that sentence is I'm just like rushing to try to do some like, <laughs> like throwing some props on the fucking stage. Like, yeah, it's all weird, but please just stay with me. The story's kind of cool and then you get that right at the end with the, like two strippers still a baby and I, I don't know that's kind of fun for me too because even though of course slept and horrors right focused a lot more on on characters who are sex workers you know of various ilks but i just i don't know i couldn't i couldn't help it i'm like i've got to get some some awesome stripper superheroes in this <laughs> collection too and i guess yeah i'm glad you enjoyed that story it's a again it's a, a difficult one as far as like receptivity goes because it's a, a world building thing because it's like an origin story of this character Ezekiel Simon Bowery who as a grown-up has some like some major rumblings as a character in a lot of my unfinished novels so it's one of those things too like as much as I love having recurring characters and you know writing in one universe at the same time I'm so anxious about it that like I'm gonna miss things and I'm gonna fuck up timelines or I'm gonna fuck up details and some judicious reader is gonna be like what the fuck, man? Like, you clearly said back in Lewis's and Prince yeah. Oba, and I'll just be like, I'm so sorry, man. Like, I'm so human. I don't even know, but <laughs> I'm stoked you liked that one. It was, yeah. I, I mean, I just love talking to you guys because you have a lot of, like, maturity and positivity, which is really inspirational for me, especially because that's not the zone I was in, you know, when we started this podcast, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I feel like you're definitely seeing the fun 
in the collection so far which makes me really happy because people often come back from my writing and they're just like it was so dark it was so intense and Mm -hmm. so sad and I was kind of like oh you know like I I don't shy away from the dark obviously but I do still try to add like hope and whimsy and I feel like you're you're digging the whimsy which is nice to hear I think it's important to you know pull out fun elements of things I mean obviously there are works out there where there's no fun to be had I've read a few things where I'm like geez I'm going to go sleep in my bed for three weeks after reading this. And then I'm never going to read that author's work again because it is just too much. But no, I found like, again, like I said at the beginning, I haven't read all the stories in this, but I've I've read a good chunk earlier too. And um, like the experimental bits I thought were fun. Some of the non stories I thought were interesting too. Like you had the uh, bully in one Oh one, an excerpt that was uh that's one of the things that kind of reminded me of like the early Henry Rollins books where it's just, as far as I know, he hasn't written anything like that, but I could get that kind of feel because it's just like a guide to bullies. You know, like what kind, like if you're in high school, what kind of bullies you would, uh, you would have to not just fend yourself off from, but like you would just encounter. So you have like these, these bullies and then some notes how to handle them. And I just kind of thought that was like fun in a way that was almost nostalgic because I just remember in school like, Oh yeah, I had that fucking kind of bully fucking dickhead. Right? Like, I, Oh, uh, that, and that's exactly how I handled that bully. Like I, I just thought that was kind of cool. That's one of those things I'd be really interested in. To hear the opinion of not someone who was bullied, but someone who was a bully to read that. And maybe they can Ooh. point out, like, are they narcissistic enough where it's like, I was none of these. I was the best friend of everybody. <laughs> or are they going to be able to go, oh, man, yeah, that was actually me. I was a I was a fucking jerk. You know, I was a uh, what was the one, the jack or the hyena or it's just like the one that laughs at you and points out the fucking zit on your lip or whatever. It's just like those kind of things. Uh, everyone probably was a bully at some point in their life but it is cool just to be able to go and see like an actual list and be like oh i was on that list or you know maybe i was just a fake friend like Mm -hmm. i like i think that's the one you started with was fake friend where it's like one of the worst bullies there are but it's probably the one that most people end up being at some point in their life just because maybe they're friends with somebody they don't quite like or mm-hmm. whatever reason they just think oh this is the person i can make fun of behind their back and stuff and uh I, I, it does have like an element of uh again self-reflection when you read that you might be able to even now go oh i'm still that kind of person to a degree mm-hmm. with my coworkers or something maybe i should be mm-hmm. a kinder nicer person um so I really like the addition of that in there, even though it wasn't actually a story. I thought it was cool just to have like that break up the stories. Well, I didn't say that if you wanted to get like really meta, you could do like how Caleb was talking about like a bully reading. And you write a story about a bully reading your that part of your <gasps> thing. And then like what? if you wanted to get super meta with it. Yeah. Maybe it changes their life. Maybe it makes yeah. them worse. Maybe. Maybe they double down. Maybe they want to go after the <laughs> like, author. This is fucking bullshit. And all of a sudden, C.E. Hoffman's getting cyber bullied by somebody that <laughs> yeah. was offended by the pointing out that they were a bully in the story. Uh, yeah, I definitely need to do that now. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna add that to the to be written <laughs> pile for sure. <laughs> And hey, I'm so stoked that you liked that excerpt. That's from one of my babies, one of my yet unpublished novels. And I wrote the first draft in high school. And again, it's so funny, like you say about, you know, introspection and looking back where I realized like, yeah, I was really, I was really trying to consolidate my experiences, you know, in a way that was going to be valuable and meaningful for people now. And I, I hope it will be. That's from a book called Observing Love's Decay. And if Ants in January, which was like my sixth or seventh novel that I mentioned already, uh, if that one isn't my debut novel, I'm thinking Observing would be a cool debut. It's full of weird shit like that because it's like the narration is kind of a meta thing where this narrator is able to get like very, very deep inside the main character's heads, Jackson and Iris. So and the way that she kind of expresses it is usually in like experimental ways like that. So yeah, I hope mm. that people will will like it. I, I wish I had some awesome announcement about observing being picked up, but I'm like so shy about it at this point. It's gone through so many rewrites. And back in the day, I did pitch it a bit, but it honestly wasn't ready, you know, to see the light of day. And I think I'm just very gun shy. I'm no, I know it'll come out in the right time, but yeah, sooner rather than later would be cool. I don't know. <laughs> if done right, I could definitely see that as something that would take off among high school kids if they 
read still. I don't, I don't know what kids do these days, but <laughs> assuming they, <laughs> they read, I could see that as one of those things well, that the would ones, be the ones getting bullied. Yeah. Well, but, we, yeah. Probably <laughs> the ones getting bullied. I could see 100%. that. I could see that taking off though with uh, even younger adults yeah. as well, just because like I said, I mean, I'm older than I'm 37. So my bullying days are long gone, but I still was able to take away is like, oh, I, I know what that felt like that felt like yeah. and I understood that. And I know like, oh, I was this kind of bully at certain times just because I was being bullied mm-hmm. and, you know, y- mm-hmm. you want to fit in or you you want what usually happens is you want to push the bullying off on someone else because yeah. you don't want to be bullied. Nobody wants to be fucking bullied. So, I, I, yeah, I just, well, you I, know, you, you're getting, you know, somebody's bullying you. So, you you know, you're all upset. You take that yeah. out on somebody else that doesn't deserve mm-hmm. it. You bully that, you know, it's like a weird, it's a, you know, a cycle. No, it's like the old, you know, the the dad gets yelled at by his boss. He goes goes home, yells at his wife. His wife yells at the kid and the kid yells at the cat. You know, yeah. it just it goes yeah. down. Um, same thing happens with kids in school. One other story I found was interesting. What, but just because of how fucking weird it was, because I wasn't, again, I don't know why, but by that point, I should have been expecting the weirdness. But uh, Chasing Bill, I think it was only like three pages or something, <laughs> but it was about a med school mannequin. And then there's this guy, I guess, works at a lab or at the school, and he's creating a, uh, like a, a poison. And he, and the funny thing is, he's not like a guy that was bullied or picked on or anything. He's just kind of a run of the mill, like us, just a dude, just some guy, not bad looking, not super handsome, no real. I mean, maybe he has faults with his character if he's making poison to kill a bunch of people. I'd imagine he would, but <laughs> no notable faults like that people outside observers might notice. But then he ends up getting sucked into the med school mannequin. Uh, I also think there was some. Uh, not an explanation, but a brief part where the mannequin mentions that he was face fucking these mannequins. Mm. So <laughs> I thought that was, uh, I was like, God, this guy is a fucking freak. He, he fits the bill. Never mind. Not that I'm kink shaming anyone who likes to face fuck med school yeah, mannequins, yeah, yeah. but it is a little bizarre. <laughs> and I'm sure it's happened. But the fact that he just gets, ends up getting, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but I guess I did. He gets sucked into like the mannequin Spoilers. and he's in there with it. And he's just like, that's, that's odd. I never read that before, so I like when I come across <laughs> something. I just like I could say 100. percent I've never read that before or anything mm-hmm. like that. So that was fun too. Oh, cheers! Yeah, I was. That is one of the ones I admit that I'm proud of. I got the idea uh, waiting at Grant Mac, which is like a like a trade slash medical kind of college here, and they offer discounted acupuncture and things like that. So I was waiting for either acupuncture or massage. And there was this med school mannequin that had kind of been left around a little bit. So I was kind of noticing it. And then, yeah, I thought, you know, for plays on perspective and narrative, how weird it would be to write a story as a med school Mm. mannequin, right? Where like you have this consciousness, but Mm. you don't really have anything else. And then that idea where it's like, the med mannequin can't do anything. He knows that the guy is going to release this virus, but he has this useless body, right? It does nothing. He only has his consciousness. And I kind of wanted to play up the idea that like he reveals it at the end. We already did the spoiler, so we can just talk about it, which is kind of fun. We're like, he was just planning on like switching bodies with him, right? Mm-hmm. He was just planning on being like, okay, I get Chase's body and then Chase will be stuck in this shit med school mannequin thing. And then I can go and be Chase and be a decent person, but he fucks yep. it up. So they're both <laughs> stuck <laughs> in the med school mannequin body. And again, like it's, it's one of those fun ones where for me, it's kind of like playful body mm-hmm. horror or something where like some people might read it and be like, oh, that's so disturbing. But again, like for, you know, guys like you who are like more open minded, you're just kind of like, this is cool. This is weird. This is and it's kind of funny because Bill's like a nice guy, right? Yeah. The med school mannequin, right? He's just kind of like, my name's Bill, you know, hi, like he's kind of just like a basic, you know, kind of personality. So there's not something it's not really sinister. Like I think Bill's actually kind of a hero, you know, and Chase is obviously a villain and, and Chase gets his. So I'm like, I don't feel sympathy <laughs> for Chase. Like, fuck that guy. Like, <laughs> well, I'm going to paraphrase, but I'm pretty sure Bill has a line along the lines of, uh, I didn't mean for you to be stuck in here with me, but at least now you can't <laughs> release the virus, like something like that. So he was just a, yes. he's a man to give me. He's a good guy. Like, <laughs> It's <laughs> all you can ask for a man, especially going through what he had to go through, which is watching this freak do all this fucking weird shit. And yeah, that that was that was a fun one. Um, yeah, there was one of the early stories too, where uh, I forget the name of it, but it's a uh, someone stuck in limbo on an awful date. I think that was the name something first date maybe, you know? but it was like someone stuck in like limbo where they're just in the shitty date with like a DJ and it's just like. They're the only one that's actually stuck there. I was like, oh, and the guy, what I really like was your descriptions of the guy's uh, 
he was a like a texting addict or a cell phone addict and in limbo he doesn't have a cell phone anymore but he's sitting there constantly just swiping his thumb and looking at his hand like a douche and i'm like that's probably how it would go like if you got some of these people like that are just addicted to their phones and if they were in the afterlife they'd probably be like ah this fucking sucks i can't where's the service why is there no service i can't doom scroll anything i can't watch 50 tiktoks in a row like what am i gonna do this sucks ass like i thought that was funny Oh, yeah. Thank you. I got to admit that that was definitely my little, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of punch. I don't know. Is that punching up? Is it punching down? I don't know. But it was definitely my, you know, my mean, my mean commentary towards how I feel about people when I see them zombying out inside their phones. Like I just because that's how I think of it is like, you're not like you're just staring at your head. Yeah. Like it's what you know, like it's and that, that story is fun, too, for me, because, again, it's a recurring character that to uh, the narrator is V, who again is like a recurring character in some unfinished novels, some just unpublished novels. And of course, there's another story featuring her later on, which is pretty cool. But yeah, like that's another fun thing, I guess, to mention. Obviously, a lot of my stories are in the big city. Some are in what I call the biggest city, which is a more like sinister, futuristic mm. uh, metropolis. But then, yeah, there's a lot of stories in limbo, much more than heaven or hell. I think limbo resonates with me a lot. <laughs> Since I haven't read the whole thing yet, what would you say is the most experimental piece in the collection or, and this could be separate, weirdest? Chasing Bill is a weird one. I, like, I like the, what I hope is kind of a surprise ending, right, with Chasing Bill. Uh, same with Schrodinger's Cats. That one has what I hope is going to, uh, you know. An I like the end of that one, surprise. too. With the yeah. portal one. Yeah, that was a good one, too. Yeah, I hope that that'll be a, a fun little surprise for Bill. I say those are definitely some weird ones. But honestly, for, like, experimental, I'm cheating. I'm opening it up because I'm like, we're most experimental. <laughs> I don't even know. I love I love the experimental stuff. Like that's definitely the place where I feel safest, you know, in my prose where when I look at my experimental stuff, yeah, like something like parting gifts before we say goodbye, right? It's very it's very experimental, it's very ethereal. It's a again, it's a weird kind of narrator uh that's this entity that exists in my my universe, which is a really weird concept, which is the same narrator. She's not the same narrator, but it's the same entity as uh narrates observing loves to decay it's this idea of there's guardian angels and guardian angels can interfere right they can actually involve themselves and save people if they need saving and then there's the much uh, shittier position of being what is called an observer where kind of like bill in a way as the med school mannequin you're you're basically just floating eyes you have great insights into whoever you're sent to watch over but you can't do shit all you can do is just watch and record their story so you know like everything there is to know about them you know them so intimately and so deeply but there's this feeling of like estranged helplessness where you you know you're wanting to shout at them to do something differently and you can't and i guess for me it's just kind of like playing on themes of of fate and even just on intimacy you know where we can love people so much you know in real life and and we want to change you know what they're doing for them but obviously we can't because they have to make their own choices and i think that's probably what i'm playing with there so yeah, i'd say that one mm. is definitely weird there's also one that's really close to my own heart it's right at the end it's called uh, one last stop and it's like a conversational narrative where it's almost just kind of like a monologue. It's like a, a one-sided dialogue where someone is talking to someone else, but you're only hearing the one voice. And she's this nameless recurring character of mine. Uh, she's like this, this, I imagine her as like to be as short as me, but like way more like stocky and butch and badass. And she's basically trying to convince uh, another character not to leave the big city but the big city is basically impossible to leave i don't know if they necessarily know that at this point though and she's she's basically begging without begging you know the person to stay and explaining why and that's probably one of my favorite things i've ever written it ends with the line uh, it's our duty to survive and i that's definitely something that i try to push through the book you know like my my suicide notes are all, you know, in it, like, <laughs> obviously not as short stories, but just as like weird little experimental -y, uh, flashes. And I think it's important to me that I kind of ended on that note of like, we've all got to stick with this, we've all got to do the best we can for ourselves, but also for each other, you know, like, right. I loved what you guys were saying, you know, about like success, sometimes just being like, you made it, you made it another year, you made it another day. And I think so much of so many 
you know, amazing creators, amazing writers, you know, who didn't, you know, and they, and they fell down and they fell by the wayside and they didn't get back up in this lifetime. And for me, with all of my struggles, I really want, you know, if some weird little, whatever they call emo kids, you know, a hundred years into the future finds my stuff and reads my biography, I don't want her to get to the end and feel totally devastated to find out that I killed myself. I want her to get to the end of my biography and it to say they lived a long, difficult, beautiful yeah. life and they didn't give up and they didn't give in, like not shaming people, you know, who do, you know, reach those points and everything. But for me, I really want to have that victory, mostly just to inspire other people. Like you're not alone in this. You can keep going and like, please keep going. One of the lines that I repeat in a lot of my books and stories is the world needs you. And I believe that. I believe that we all have something really, really awesome to offer. And if my writing can just inspire a few more people to stick around, I think I would definitely consider my whole life a success. That'd be a major win, actually. I felt the inclusion of those notes was, one, it kind of gave you a genuine look into you, you, know, you as an author. And it also, I mean, especially like the last note, it, it did have touches of hope into it that I think are important. And it, it was just authentic. Like it, it just kind of peels back like, oh, this isn't just a short story collection with fantastical elements and experimental fiction. It's it's also like this is a real person writing this with real emotions and real feelings. And it does give you, you know, the, like a, a basis of realism. Like it sets you and grounds you a little bit. Whereas if you didn't have those, if they weren't included, I think the I wouldn't say the collection would be worse off or better off. I just think it would be more fantastical maybe maybe mm -hmm. people wouldn't think of it in the same manner um, like i said i haven't read the whole collection so i can't really judge on that but just the way you described how you ended it i can see that it does culminate with the the theme of hope so i think that's important and it i, th I think that would be something that i would definitely implore people to read if they're having any kind of mental health issues or you know they just feel maybe just down on themselves or whatever it may be struggling with addictions or problems because not only do you get the escapism of just good fiction but you also get somebody who you know maybe understands you like you could feel like oh c.e hoffman yep. understands what i'm going through because they've gone through similar things or they at least understand what it's like and i think that's also important to put out into the world is not just the positive spin but you know you have to show people at their you know not the, maybe not their rock bottom but you have to show people when they're not doing great because as authors <laughs> You know, we always want people to think, oh, we're doing good. We're, we're writing this. And here's another publication. And oh, we're happy. Here's us smiling, having drinks out at the cafe. <laughs> you know, here's our book launch. Here's our book signing. But sometimes it's important that they see, oh, no, this person has been toiling away in a fucking dark room for three weeks. And now yeah. their mental health isn't the best. And maybe they need to <laughs> pick me up. And maybe they need a, uh, some kind words. And maybe they need just somebody to listen or people just to stay away for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think all th those are all very valuable. So I think the inclusion of those notes is important and I'm glad you put those in there. Oh, thanks. Cause I really hesitated about it. I'm very proud. It's so funny to say that, you know, and so many of my stories are inspired by my own experiences, but I'm also very private, you know, even like things like, you know, my sexuality and gender identity and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Like I'm, I'm not the kind of person that's like, I want to trumpet this or want to self-identify in a submission and stuff like that. And I, I think the main reason, apart from just being genuinely private is I'm honestly concerned, you know, that reception will be cynical, you know, that people will be like like oh look at you you know you're self-aggrandizing being like poor poor me feel so bad you know and and i i really don't want that and it, i really appreciate that you gleaned the genuineness from it because it was just a genuinely vulnerable moment for me where i'm like i haven't i <laughs> you know it hasn't been an easy time getting here and it's still it's still a real struggle you know on and off my coping mechanisms are lit now you know and if anyone ever wants to email me and talk coping mechanisms i'm always there because it's a long road that's gotten me to the point where i have this fantastic arsenal but that doesn't change you know what i experience on a mental level and on an internal level and just wanting to be more honest about that i think especially because we try to show our best face to the world and for me i try to show my kindest face because of the things i've been through i want to be kind but that's not all of what's in here like even when i was talking it's funny actually to even uh 
end on this note almost maybe depending how much longer we go because this is I just read an email from a university uh, basically saying like yeah we can't uh, take you like they were going to do a teach out program with the university that I did get into which is now going to defunct due to financial difficulty and then I just was informed that they don't do BA waivers so they won't be able to to let me mm. in uh, and it's just one of those things where you just do it like <sighs> Okay, like another little punch, like just keep going, right? Everything always works out. But it was funny because when I talked to that admissions advisor who just gave me that news, she was like, oh yeah, just from talking to you for a few minutes, I can just tell that you're like such a sweetheart and you're like so nice and you're so kind. And I was like, that's really nice. And I was actually honest with her. And I was like, to be honest, I think that's just a very thin veneer covering up <laughs> my like intense emo rage yeah. and angst. And like, and like she laughed and was like, oh, I get that too kind of thing. And I'm just kind of like, I don't, even when I try, you know, to be honest, and I'm like, there is like a major little rage bear in here. You know, I still think people just go, oh, ha, 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 yeah, right. You know, like you can't actually feel that and I guess yeah in a way art is how we we try to get in connection with our innermost selves and we try to be seen but again that we also try to to help people see like yeah even the little bubbly pixie types you know that look like they you know never had any shit happen to them in their lives they feel it too you know we're all in this together and I'm hoping yeah that the more vulnerable and genuine I am in my writing the more I inspire people to do the same just in their own life you know, like I think art should be an extension of our personal integrity. And we all do that in different ways. But yeah, for me, I think including those notes in there was a, a risky effort in that, I think. But yeah, I'm glad that it came off for you, at least. And I do hope that it, it helps. And yeah, and definitely gives hope to other people who read it as well. Well, even if you... I don't know how I want to phrase that. So I won't. Um, <laughs> we are nearing the hour, Mark. Um, I will ask you one more question, and then we'll do the promo stuff. How does that sound? Because uh, not that I actually have anything to do, but it's the editing of these podcasts that kill me because I procrastinate dearly. Right? Yeah, you wait till like the day before it's supposed to be released. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably edit that. Yeah, and then usually that also sucks because the day before it's released is the day we do another interview with yeah. people. <laughs> um, so, I, I one thing, I, I probably mentioned this multiple times now, but I really enjoyed was the experimental aspects of your fiction. Do you have any influences? I know you mentioned like Virginia Woolf and I think you have a story... Uh, something titled with Henry James, do you actually have influences that inspired you to write this way? Or was it just something that was like, oh, I like that kind of writing and now I'm going to steer into it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've definitely touched on some of my influences for sure, you know, which is great. And it's so funny because, I mean, obviously, like, obviously, right, I've been so deeply inspired by all of these writers that have touched my life, you know, whether living or dead and have nothing but endless appreciation for them and for musicians as well and filmmakers as well and playwrights, you know, and musical composers as well. But it's so funny because you'd think I would have like the list always prepared at the drop of a hat now. And people ask, what are your influences? Who are your inspirations? And there's always this like panic in me. that's like, oh yeah, I got I got a name drop now. But if I'm honest, like, I know I've already, yeah, mentioned quite a few of them, you know, and like people like, you know, Chris Krauss and, you know, Edith Wharton, Zadie Smith, like my tastes run the gamut at the end of the day, you know, Nidazaki Shange, you know, forever changed from that work, you know, but I feel like it's that quote that's often misattributed. It's cool. I read the history about the quote and it's like misattributed to this famous author because like he just had like the same initialization in his name, but you can only trace it back to this like little college magazine that was probably just quoting like some dude at yeah. the college, which is pretty cool. But it's that line that's like, um, you know, I can't remember all the books I have read any more than the meals I have eaten, all the same they have made me. And I think that's that's the vibe, I think, for me at this point in my writing journey where there's just been so much and I'm just so indebted you know to every library shelf you know and every free library on the street and even every fucking like Amazon purchase and shit oh this is one name that I will like just to totally negate everything I just said I was like oh the names don't matter no but this name matters I have to say uh Don Powell is this really new um inspiration for me I read Dance Night 
And it's cool because she was kind of more known commercially as like a satirist and like a comedian, you know, and things like that and wrote a lot of satire and stuff. And as far as I know, this is probably her one truly what I would call like an earnest novel. And apparently it was her personal favorite. And yeah, Dance Night by Don Powell. It like it was one of those books that made living be okay again. And there's nothing better than a book like that, a book that you can literally love because it made you feel hope and life again you know oh, and, for sure oh yeah and again kind of the same as my aspirations right like if I could write that kind of book that makes someone cry in a good way you know and hug the book to their chest at the end and just be like thank you you know dead C.E. Hoffman you know because that's <laughs> the love that I'm pouring out to Don Powell now you know after reading that work it's just so much a gratitude you know, and yeah, I hope that I just do my little part, you know, lay my little brick into the, the literary wall, you know, that is human magnificence. And I hope that some other awesome humans build on my brick and we keep just doing beautiful things. Like it makes me think of that, um, that really beautiful, terrible moment in Man's Search for Meaning, right, by Victor E. Frankel, where uh, there's some, some men, you know, working in the concentration camp, and they all pause. And I think it's because they see it was probably a bird, you know, flying overhead. And I try not to get emotional every time I tell this, but I get emotional every time I tell this. And one of the men said, life could be so beautiful. Mm. And I think that's what we're really trying to do with art is we're trying to help life be beautiful like it could and should be. And that's my hope, you know, for yeah. us, for this podcast, you know, for everything that we write, even when we delve into the ugly and the weird and the silly and the freaky, you know, I think there's always that hope and that beauty lingering there just waiting to be seen. And if my words can help people see it a little better and be inspired to shine a little brighter, then yeah, like it makes it makes literally all of it worth it. The beauty of the artist is that we are unaware usually of who we inspire. So if somebody reads your collection and not only do you, you know, you perhaps give them hope. Uh, you don't know who you might keep alive. You don't know who might throw the book in the fucking garbage. I mean, it's always a, it's a gamut. But there's always, you know, there's always that chance that someone reads your work and then all of a sudden they want to be a writer and they want to, you know, put forth the effort. And the the weird thing about inspiration is it doesn't always come from whatever it is that you're trying to be. You know, you could be a writer or a painter or whatever, but it doesn't necessarily have to be from that uh, medium that you get inspired. Like mm -hmm. I was, uh, I went down a wormhole yesterday of Aphex Twin and I don't know <laughs> shit about electronic, like how to create electronic music on weird 90s software, but just like the obsessive nature of creating art that Richard James had was just like, holy shit, that's what I need to do. I need to just mm -hmm. become more obsessed with writing and not that I am even really necessarily enjoy Aphex Twin because it's fucking kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I could just like that obsessive nature and just like having that love for your art form, whether anyone actually enjoys it or not. It's just the fact mm -hmm. that you like it and then that can inspire other people. I think that is like a, almost a, a magic in, in and of itself. But anyway, we have hit the hour mark. Yeah. So I think that's a good uh, way to end it. Promotion time. If you want to promote your fancy book party, your book launch, uh, websites, uh, you said you're on Twitter, you know, whatever you want. It, it, the floor is yours for the moment. Yeah, cheers. CEHoffman.net. That's where you can find me. Yeah, I probably mentioned it already way too many times. But yeah, I'm not a phone person, not a huge social media person, but my email is right on the website, which maybe is not the most intelligent thing to do. But I also want to be reachable, you know. So and yeah, definitely if there's aspiring writers or just like-minded emerging artists like myself that want to connect. I love getting those emails. I love helping out when I can. I love connecting and collabing. Yeah, plug it one more time. June 30th, Edmonton, Alberta, the Grindstone Theater, free entry. Only nice people, please, is the book party lunch. And of course, Losers and Freaks is now on pre-order, so everyone can pre-order a copy now and it'll be officially for sale on June 30th. And yeah, just much love to anyone who's listening. I appreciate you and the world needs you. Excellent. Check that book out, folks. I trust uh, trust my opinion. Mm. Because, you know, if you're listening to this, obviously you're just infatuated with the DPW guys. So trust us when we say it is a great collection of stories and you definitely should pre-order it now. 
if you want to follow us and our work, we are on X, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at DPW Podcast. Apparently, there's something called Cara now for yeah, artists. I've, I've seen Dirk Manning was. I've seen a- yeah, like different people like, oh, this is my. I wasn't even sure how to say it. Say it until you just said it. That nice. might be incorrect. I don't know C A R A. So yeah, th- maybe that'll be something we'll go down and try to get like blue skies yeah well i'm on blue sky <laughs> fuck it does nothing uh also <laughs> if you want to check out spencer's only fans this week uh what are you the stockholm street surgeon yeah that's some that's like more dark web than only fans i don't think what you're doing on there unless you're just like you know free service i don't yes. know i don't know what you're doing in stockholm uh also you could check out my publication history and the writing that I always forget to post on my website at <laughs> calebjamesk.com. That was uh, another fun episode yeah. in the book. CE, thank you for coming on. It was a, a lot of fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Sometimes these are, I don't want to say a chore, but they're more difficult than what this was. This was a lot of well, fun. And nice that it actually worked. Too. And that it worked was a bonus, too. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, guys. Ditto. It was awesome. All right, folks, we will check you out next week with, I think, David Winter is supposed to come on. Uh, So we'll check you out next week, folks.